Greetings. Since I'm not in class today, I'd like to give a brief presentation on the last segment of our unit on the Gilded Age, the New South and Segregation. Now first take a look at this image. Look at this image and compare it with the next image. This is a much different view of the South. The view of the South that leaders wanted to promote around the country as the South attempted to rebuild in the aftermath of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And so this term New South was coined by Henry Grady, editor of the Atlanta Constitution. And the emphasis was for the South to build new businesses and investments after Reconstruction. One of the biggest lessons that Southerners learned after the Civil War era is that building an economy that was reliant on one particular crop or one particular economic activity, in this case being cotton, was dangerous. With cotton being destroyed during the Civil War, the South's economy was destroyed. So if Southern leaders wanted to build a better and stronger economy for the future, they had to diversify. One of the advantages, of course, in diversification would be bringing industries to the South. And the great advantage is that cotton, the raw materials for all the textile industrialization, resides in the South. So textile manufacturers could move their factories to the South because they would be right next to the raw materials and they wouldn't have to incur the cost of transportation. Also, labor was cheap in the South and manufacturers could pay a much lower wage for workers in the South than they had to pay in the North, especially with the growth of the Union mo movement. And so with this growth, the South expands geographically and economically, although much slower than the North. New cities emerge, and cities will start to become focused on particular economic activities. For example, the steel industry in Alabama. Also, tourism will develop in the South, especially in places like Jacksonville. You may not realize this, but Jacksonville became one of the hottest and most popular tourist destinations of the South. I'll pause for a moment so you can gasp in disbelief. But in fact, people would take steamships to Savannah or Charleston, and then take smaller ships to Jacksonville, and Jacksonville became a haven for the rich and famous in the late 1800s. Very wealthy northerners would vacation here, and there were beautiful spa houses and resorts that would line Bay Street and the St. John's River, and people would take leisurely river tours down the St. John's and back, and really enjoying the, the life and the sights of Jacksonville. You might say, well, where did all of these things go? Many of them were burned down in the Great Fire of 1901, although a lot of the city's infrastructure was built thereafter. And so Jacksonville's history is a great microcosm for understanding what the South was trying to create in the post-Reconstruction years. I also put this bullet here called Romance of Reunion. It's very interesting when you look at the literature in this time period of the relationship of Northerners and Southerners. It almost takes a romantic tone. I have one book that I'm staring at in my office right now by Nina Silber. I believe we've seen her in a couple of the President series. Nina Silber wrote a book called The Romance of Reunion, and she touches on this idea of how the North and South would be reunited again, and in the writings you see this very romantic aspect. In fact, the Spanish-American War in 1898 seems to be the point where we see the North and the South finally reunited again, and Northerners and Southerners viewing themselves as Americans again, and not necessarily Northerners and Southerners. Well, why is that? Well, it had been a generation since the Civil War by 1898, and a war usually unites a country where both Northerners and Southerners are responding to something and joining the effort. But despite all of this economic growth, the South was still very economically behind the rest of the country, and it really takes until World War I for the South to finally catch up. So next I'd like to look at this excerpt from Henry Grady. Henry Grady is the person who coined the term the New South, and that is on your study guide. The Old South rested everything on slavery and agriculture, unconscious that these could neither give nor maintain healthy growth. The New South presents a perfect democracy,
the oligarchs leading in the popular movement, a social system compact and closely knitted, less splendid on the surface, but stronger at the core. A hundred farms for every plantation, fifty homes for every palace, and a diversified industry that meets the complex need of this complex age. So notice the comparison of how this new era would be different from this era. The New South is enamored of her new work. Her soul is stirred with the breath of a new life. The light of a grander day is falling fair on her face. She is thrilling with the consciousness of growing power and prosperity. As she stands upright, full statured and equal among the people of the earth, breathing the keen air and looking out upon the expanded horizon, she understands that her emancipation came because through the inscrutable wisdom of God, her honest purpose was crossed, and her brave armies were beaten. Now just imagine being an ex-Confederate and hearing this phrase here. Her brave armies were beaten. So analyze this passage here. What is he saying? That this had to happen in order for this new work to be accomplished. That the Civil War, and maybe this is the implica implication here, is that the Civil War was necessary to prove that this system didn't work. Wow. That would be somewhat controversial, especially for older readers of this passage. But the focus here is how the New South is much better, much stronger, and much more lasting than the Old South. That now Southerners can look forward to the light of a grander day and look at thrillingly with the consciousness of growing power and prosperity. So this should be a very uplifting passage. As we think about critical reading skills, what's the tone here? It's uplifting and it's hopeful. I'm hoping at this point that you're not so bored by this that you're banging your head against the wall or something. This is kind of odd because I'm sitting in my home office by myself talking to my iPad, which I'm sure makes my family think that I've gone a little bit nutty, but they knew that already. Anyways, back to the subject. Let's look at a more negative view of the South. Remember that during Reconstruction, the 15th Amendment was passed, which guaranteed all men, regardless of race, the right to vote. Well, when white redeemers, when ex-Confederates and Southern whites took back the South, they created legal ways to prevent blacks from voting. Even if you have the constitutional right to vote, you still have to be registered in your state to actually vote. And so they came up with these mechanisms that you read about in your book, like grandfather clauses. A grandfather clause meant that if your grandfather could vote, then you could vote. Or if your grandfather could vote, then you were exempt from the voting restrictions. Some of these other voting restrictions were literacy tests. These tests would be very hard for African Americans who had no prior education to pass. I read one from the 1920s or 1930s that said, write out from memory the first five sections of the Mississippi State Constitution. Really, who's going to be able to do that? Also, poll taxes were created. So, new registrants for voting would have to pay a pretty stiff fee to be able to vote. And all of these were intended to keep African Americans from voting. And of course, if this didn't work, then sheer intimidation would be used. And this is a topic we're going to come back to a lot in the 20th century as we move up to the Civil Rights Movement. Also, laws were created to segregate whites and blacks in society. One law in particular, or rules for racial etiquette, would be that if a black man was walking down the street and a white woman was walking his direction, he would have to cross the street so that he did not pass within so many feet of the white woman. What happens if he breaks that law? There's no due process. There's no jury trial of your peers. Instead, oftentimes it would be vigilante violence or a lynching, which is death by hanging. So these are the legalized forms of segregation that happened in the South, and this begins the era of white restrooms and colored restrooms and white water fountains and colored water fountains. 
And you might say, but wait a second, during Reconstruction we passed rules against this. Well, in 1883, the Supreme Court overturned a lot of the Congressional Civil Rights Act saying that the federal government was overstepping its bounds. Then in 1896, the Supreme Court, in a very, very famous case, in a case that you should know, in Plessy v. Ferguson, said that separate but equal was okay. You might be asking, wait a second, there's nothing equal about segregation. What the case revolved around were railroad cars in Louisiana. There were cars for whites and cars for blacks, and obviously the condition of those cars were much different. But in this case involving Homer Plessy, the Supreme Court said as long as there were facilities for whites and blacks, then it was constitutional. The great outcome of this case is the education system in the South. We will see white schools and colored schools, and the differences in those schools will be very, very unique. Unique is not even strong enough of a word. Um, white schools would have well-paid well or adequately paid teachers, uh, furniture and books and all the things you would expect in a nicely run school. African Americans would have little resources and very low paid teachers and given a much different educational experience. This didn't finally end until the Supreme Court overturned Plessy in 1954 in Brown v. Board of Education, which we will address later in the school year. Finally fixing and moving away from segregated schools to integrated schools is a process that will go on throughout the 1960s and early 1970s. So ask your parents. If your parents grew up here in the South, they probably remember integration. I know my dad going to Wolfson High School in the 1970s remembers integration and remembers racial tensions here in Jacksonville as white and black students were bused all over town. So then the question becomes, what do we do about discrimination? There is a new generation of African-American leaders, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois in particular, which you should have read about them in your book already. Today in our group activity, we're going to look at documents from the two of them. Both of them dislike segregation. Both of them argue for African-American education. But both of them differ in their approaches. And that is the key thing I want you to learn today in your groups looking at the documents. How do they differ in their approaches to education and their approaches to the challenge of segregation? Also, it's important to understand Ida Wells, especially her campaign to end lynching in America. So keep that in your mind as you work together in groups today. And finally, I bring up this slide to make the point that discrimination was not isolated to the South, and it was not simply legal segregation. I mentioned lynching already as a form of violence. The Ku Klux Klan and other groups enforced these rules for racial etiquette in the South. Also remember, we learned during the Reconstruction Unit that the Southern social structure that we knew prior to the Civil War re-emerges after the Civil War, and we will see that social structure be very caste-like, where wealthy landowners are at the top and African Americans are at the bottom. Also, I wanted to make a point that I noticed on your midterm exam, or pardon me, not the midterm exam, but the last unit test prior to the midterm exam. There was a document on sharecropping, and Many students answered that the system of sharecropping, it was an example of a sharecropping contract, was fair. It is important to note that with sharecropping, these agreements that African Americans would sign, they were putting themselves in a continual cycle of debt where they constantly owed a huge rent to the white landowner for farming their small plot of land. And often these legal agreements were worded in such a complex manner, and of course being signed by people who did not have much prior education, that it left them in a continual cycle of debt that they were never able to escape. And so I would argue that these contracts, in fact, were not fair. And this may be an area that we'll touch on again later as we look at the South in the 20th century. Also, we want to mention that discrimination is not isolated to the South. It existed for Mexican workers in the Southwest. 
As we've discussed earlier in this unit, it existed for Chinese laborers in the West as well. And I didn't put it on this slide, but we should also add here, discrimination continues in the North, especially related to the competition for jobs and for that tenement house living where people are living very closely together in the cities, there will be racial problems. And we'll see these racial problems really emerge in the 20th century. Okay, well hopefully you haven't run from the classroom screaming and I haven't put you to sleep. Again, I'm sitting here talking to myself. Let me give you some direction on what you're going to do next. So in your groups, you're going to download the Washington Du Bois Document Activity PDF. I've built a Schoology assignment for today. Just like we've done before, open that to Notability, add in your brief notes, discuss your answers with one another, and then each of you will submit it back to the Dropbox. Then I would like you to use the remaining time to go over the study guide in Google Drive. Remember that I added in a lot of questions to the study guide knowing that I would be gone for review. And I asked you throughout the unit to make contributions to the study guide as we go along. So I'm hoping that at this point the study guide is in really good shape. But if you find areas that are missing, please contribute. If you find areas where you're not sure, post it to the wall. And while I'm at the conference, I will try to respond to you during my breaks. And I'll also hop on the study guide and try to clean it up before you take your test. But of course, as always, in an honors class especially, you are responsible for this material, and I know that you'll do well. So I hope that the rest of the class goes well for you. Thank you for listening, and have a great day, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Monday.